Hello, welcome to the Lambeth Country Show and thanks for coming to have a look at my talk, which is plot to plate. I'll explain a little bit about what that means in a moment. Um, but I'll just introduce myself. Apologies if you've watched one of my other talks and have heard this already. But uh, my name is Alan Williams. Uh, this is me at three years old uh, with a runner bean plant. Um, and I think this is kind of the earliest point I can say I remember being uh, interested in gardening. Uh, we were lucky enough uh, as, as kids with my parents to have a reasonable sized garden and when I was growing up I had a small veggie patch in one corner of it where I'd grow carrots and runner beans and lettuces and a few other things and I think I got my gardening inspiration uh, probably from my dad on the left there and also my maternal grandfather who were both great gardeners and lovers of the countryside in general and I think that rubbed off on me and uh, it's kind of stuck ever since. So if this was a live talk and we were all at the show together, um, I think I'd be asking you about now, where do you garden and, and what's your interest? And I hope I'm not going to talk too much about uh, things that you already know about, but apologies if I do. I hope you'll bear with me. But if you do have any kind of questions or uh, feedback, uh, uh, there's some links at the end of the talk uh, in terms of how you can get hold of me. So what do I mean by plot to plate? Uh, plot to plate or fork to fork growing as it's also known. Um, it, it's something when people find out that, you, that you've got an allotment, they say, oh, I'd love an allotment, but I don't think I'd know what to, to grow. You know, and I thought, well, what do you like to eat? Grow what you like to eat. It's very much my ethos of, of plot to plate. You know, if you like particular vegetable, then grow it uh, if you can, if the climate allows. Obviously, seasonal veg is very much uh, the way to go. But, um, you yeah, know, most things can be grown in this country, uh, if not in the ground, maybe in a greenhouse or whatever. Um, but today what I'm going to do is talk about, you know, taking that growing and what you grow and turning it into to what you eat. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about vegetables that complement one another, both in terms of the growing and the cooking. Um, if you haven't got a big allotment or a garden, what you can do in, you know, with small plots and containers um, and what are you going to do when you get lots of the same veg? So you get gluts um, and, you know, what do you do with those um bits of it will be more in in detail than others um and as i say you know if we were doing this in person you'd get to sample uh some of the plate stuff um unfortunately being a virtual talk we can't do that so please feel free to use your imagination and then maybe another time we'll be able to try uh some some produce together so um, I always have a plan about um, where I'm going to grow things on my plot. And I talk about how important that plan is and growing in a, in a rotation system so you don't have the same things in the same place each year. Um, now, complementary planting throws that out a little bit because uh, you're thinking about not just uh, not following on but deliberately growing things together. So what do I mean by complementary or companion planting as it's also known? Well, this is about planting uh, one plant to the benefit of another. And that might be mutually beneficial or it might be, um, it might be that you're doing it deliberately because uh, you want to put plants that will effectively sacrifice themselves for another. Um, you might do it to deter pests um, or you might do it to uh, in, attract pollinators. So you might want uh, something that has lots of flowers to bring the pollinators in so that they will pollinate the veg plants that you uh, ultimately want to get uh, pollinated and get veg from. Um, but also uh, from the, the plate side, it's about improving taste 
um, flavor um, and also improving yield so that you get uh, more bang for your buck um, and you know it, it's worth thinking about maximizing the, you know the variety of your crops um, because then you get uh, more things that you can experiment with in the kitchen and uh, in the in the cooking process now um, a classic example of of companion planting is something called the three sisters garden now this is a version of uh, complementary planting that was uh, very much used by the Native Americans um, and one that works really well if you've got limited space so you can grow beans, squash or courgettes or something like that and sweet corn in the same plot together. You stagger the planting a little bit um, because you want to plant the sweet corn um, first. And what that does is that then provides a framework for your beans, which can climb up the sweet corn. Um, and then the squash provides um ground cover to to keep weeds down and also to reduce evaporation from the soil so it retains moisture in the soil now this works reasonably well i've tried it um, and i've had some some reasonable success with it i think you need to be careful uh, with some modern varieties that you pick the right varieties to go together so if you're going to pick um, a variety of sweet corn you want one that uh, produces nice stout stems um, and you don't necessarily want uh, a, a variety of beans that produces hundreds and thousands of pods because it just becomes too heavy for the sweet corn um, to support so you then end up having to provide canes and things like that as, as supplementary support um, but you know I can see why this was done and it does work reasonably well um, and yeah, it's worth a go if you haven't got a lot of space because you can grow the three together um, and get quite acceptable uh, results. And obviously you, you can do whatever you will with the, the produce that you produce. Again, apologies. Um, I've talked about this in another talk. So if you've heard that talk, you might want to skip ahead a few seconds. One of the other things you can do is is grow crops that are not necessarily there uh, for uh, direct companion means um, and they're not food crops so this is something called comfrey and it is a it's a fantastic plant uh, but it is very vigorous so you want to keep it well under control um, you don't need very much of it um, it's a plant that grows very quickly it produces an awful lot of flowers which are fantastic for pollinators for bees and and so on um, so it's a really great plant for attracting pollinators into the garden or onto the allotment um, but you do not want it to go to seed um, so what you do is is let it grow and then when it's finished flowering and before it sets seed literally cut it off a ground level hack it right back um, and then uh, find a bucket, preferably one with a lid. And I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. But uh, strip the leaves off of the stems of the comfrey and put the leaves in the bucket. Uh, the stems can just go on the compost heap. You don't need to worry about uh, retaining them. And then um, just cover the leaves in the bucket with uh, some water from the water butt. You don't need a huge amount of water. You want enough to cover the leaves um, and put a, a stone or something on the leaves just to keep them below the surface of the water so that they're not floating up. And then put the lid on and then put something else to, on top to keep the lid on. And then just leave it for about three, four weeks. The reason you want to put the lid on is because basically what you're doing is this is rotting down and it is going to start to smell and it smells horrendous um, so the lid keeps the worst of the smell uh, inside the bucket um, after that three or four weeks uh, take the, the the stone and the, and the bucket out uh, lid off the bucket and then you want to decant that mixture um, into uh, some bottles preferably bottles again that have got lids because of the smell 
be careful when you decant it. Do not want this on your clothes because it is horrendously stinky. Um, and then the sludge that you've got in the bottom, just I always say tip it on your neighbor's compost heap because, again, that really smells. But, again, tip it on your compost heap. It will finish rotting down completely and, and kind of disappear fairly quickly. So uh, that bit of the smell is relatively short-lived. Um, but then you can use this as a, a liquid fertilizer or a foliar feed. You, all you do is uh, dilute it uh, a few mils in a in a five liter watering can. You don't need a huge amount. It lasts. It goes a long way. Um, and as I say, then just water your plants as as or, or veg as normal, um, and it will provide a nice uh, broad spectrum uh, fertilizer. So it's not a, a true complementary plant in the sense of um, you know it doesn't you don't grow it necessarily alongside other plants uh, and it's not there the whole time. The other thing you can do um, if you're growing potatoes is you can hack it back and just put the the foliage um, along the ridges of your potato uh, trenches and it will keep. Uh, it will help more with uh, moisture evaporation um, and as, as it rots down you'll get the um, benefit um, with the potato you know rotting down and providing nutrients for the potatoes so it's a kind of multi-purpose uh, plant really good definitely again be careful though it will take over if you let it um, so you want to keep it in check so Back to kind of true complementary planting for a minute. Now, deterring pests. Obviously, we all have problems with things like um, slugs and and aphids and things like that. But what can what tricks can you uh, play on the nasties to to keep them at bay? Well, if you're growing onions, um, and you're also growing carrots or tomatoes what you can do is if you grow them next to one another um, you can help keep things like uh, the carrot root fly off of your carrots or aphids off of your tomatoes now the way this works is you can imagine what an onion smells like well both um, carrot root fly and aphids to an extent, use smell as a way of finding uh, the, the the plant that they most want to eat. Um, and if you can think of when you if you think of that smell when you pull carrots, that carrot smell, that's what the carrot root fly is looking for. Uh, so you always get problems with carrot root fly if around the time you're harvesting carrots, and if you don't harvest the whole crop. Uh, in at once then they will find uh the remainder of the crop and and uh start to to dis destroy it for you but but if you've got onions next to your carrots it helps disguise that that carrot smell and the same principle with um tomatoes another one that works well um is french marigolds around um deterring aphids on your beans or eelworms digging into your potatoes um, and white fly and aphids on things like sweet corn um, again it's a it's a smell thing um, but it works quite well so uh, those are two that you could try obviously um, you want pollinators you want the bees and the butterflies and things like that to come along and and pollinate your food crops um, but one of the ways you can do that is to give them other things to attract them in. So growing sweet peas um, in and around runner beans and French beans will really help. Um, they'll home in on the sweet peas and they'll home in on your the flowers on your runner beans and your French beans as well. Um, calendula in your in your squash patch your, with your courgettes and your pumpkins and your squashes. Again, that will help attract the pollinators to your to your squashes um, and you'll get more uh, successfully pollinated fruit and yarrow generally um, yarrow is the thing that has the big umbella for flowers 
um, but generally through the, the veg bed again be a little bit careful with that it can take over if you're not careful um, so you want to just to, to keep it in check and not let it get out of control but what about um, sacrificial plants now if you grow uh, brassicas or cabbages or cauliflower or sprouts things like that um, you'll know that cabbage whites love cabbage white butterflies love to lay their eggs um, on your brassicas and then when the caterpillars emerge they'll munch away on your brassicas one of the things you can do is grow nasturtiums because cabbage whites will also lay eggs on nasturtiums and then the caterpillars will just eat the nasturtiums um, now obviously you need still to net your brassicas but it, if you give them give the cabbage white a, a real big target to aim for with nasturtiums um, you'll be uh, needing to worry less about gaps in nets and things like that um, you can eat nasturtiums as well yourself um, they're quite tasty but uh, uh, I tend to grow them purely from the point of view of having them as, a, as an alternative for the cabbage white butterfly um, and then they tend to leave my uh, brassicas alone I still net my brassicas by the way I don't rely purely on having the sacrificial nasturtiums there um, basil plants around your um, tomatoes and cucumbers helps keep white fly away um, it's also obviously you can grow it as a, as a herb in its own right um, and it's one of those things that if you're planting it around peppers and tomatoes but also lettuces, lettuces and aubergines it helps improve the flavour of those plants too as does having um, peas and beans and sweet peas improves the yield around lots of things in terms of improving soil fertility so growing sweet peas around fruit bushes um, or, or trees helps and that yarrow that I mentioned before as well as attracting pollinators is also quite good for for soil fertility and those that improving flavor and yield doesn't just apply to when you're growing so if you take the basil example for it for um, growing around tomatoes if you're growing it around tomatoes and you're harvesting it at the same time putting basil in when you're uh, making a roast tomato sauce for example so simply putting tomatoes in the oven with some olive oil and salt and pepper and basil and then leaving it to roast in the oven for 45 minutes or so at, you know gas mark five or six um, and then when it comes out blending it down uh, with a with a hand blender or a food processor and you can use that in soups in pasta dishes basically wherever you need that kind of tomato roast tomato sort of passata type sauce um, and it freezes well you know and if you've got a real big glut of tomatoes and you can convert them into tomato sauce that way you're going to cut down on the numbers of tins of tomatoes that you buy from the supermarket I guarantee it now I mentioned growing in um, small pots and containers not everybody has that large garden or access to spa to a space of an allotment you know we've many people have got small back gardens or you live in a flat or you're a bit constrained by space in other ways now using containers um, you know allows you to grow just as many things you might actually want to grow small plants um, you might pick small varieties now this is a small variety of pumpkin that I actually wouldn't recommend growing but it's I'll use it as an example nonetheless um, if you think how big a, a kind of jack-o-lantern pumpkin can be um, you know you and you haven't got a lot of space that's going to take up an awful lot of room but there are smaller varieties of things and if you come back to grow what you love to eat if you have to prioritize space then really focus on those things that you love to eat um, and that will be practical in the space that you have. You know, those need to be your number one crops. And uh, then if you've got space left, look at other things. You know, if you're growing seasonally in cycles, there are some things that, you know, generally always 
are at a low price in the shops, things like onions and potatoes. So if you're restricted with space, don't use your valuable space on the things that are cheap. You know, concentrate on the things that you love to eat and that, you know, ultimately would cost you a lot in um, in the shops. And think about how you utilise that space. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a, a balcony or a window box um, or a container or hanging baskets or if you can put trellis up a wall, you know, things like, squashes and tomatoes and vines and things like that will all grow up the side of a wall if you give them a little bit of extra support you don't need just to have a big flat bit of ground you know if you've got uh, vertical surfaces use them you know and again coming back to what i said about different varieties you know there are lots of varieties on the market now you get tumbling tom tomatoes for example that are you know, perfect for a hanging basket. That's how, that's what they were grown for. They're a bush tomato that will grow loads and loads. Um, I grow them uh, in in my in my back garden, and they are some of the most successful and vigorous plants um, you can imagine. So, as I say, think in three dimensions. Uh, don't uh, necessarily think that. Uh, a garden has to be a flat open bit of space um of course if you're familiar with heath robinson he had uh, other ideas about how you could uh, lay out your garden i'm not suggesting for a moment that uh, you go to his extremes but you know be creative with your space um and think about you know where you might grow uh, different varieties if you're going to do something like grow to grow potatoes, think about growing them at different times of the year. So if you're growing uh, potatoes uh, in pots or containers, some bags, um, you can grow and have new potatoes for Christmas, but you're going to have to have them indoors uh, just to protect them from frost. So you can start them outdoors and bring them in. Um, just be careful, obviously, if you're lifting a heavy container that you're uh, not going to hurt yourself and, and, and spend Christmas lying flat on your back because you've uh, slipped a disc or done some done yourself some mischief. But um, planting potatoes in kind of late August, early September, um, you can have nice new potatoes for Christmas Day if you're growing them in a container um, and they're in a potting shed or a, or, a, or a cool greenhouse or something like that. Just protect them from frost. So what happens when you get too much all together um, and nobody wants to take it off your hands because people cross the road when they see you coming because they think they're gonna, you're going to give them some courgettes. It happens every year, something, um, whatever size of plot you get, you plant an extra courgette plant because you didn't think they were all going to survive and then you and they all come good and you end up with hundreds um you become known as the courgette guy um well if it's courgettes or if it's gherkins or whatever it is there are always opportunities and options um i've been growing a lot of gooseberries uh, in the last few years um certainly the last four years have been fantastic for gooseberries um i've been turning them into ice cream and freezing it uh, I've been turning them into this gooseberry and red onion chutney, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and that keeps for ages. Um, just make the chutney, bottle it, uh, make sure it's going in, obviously going into sterile jars and sterile lids. But it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to, you know, gooseberries tend to be a little bit tart. Uh, and... You know, you want the sweet ones for, you know, just eating as a as a gooseberry. But the ones that are a little bit uh, younger and tartar are great in in ice cream and in things like chutneys. So what have we had gluts of in previous years? Uh, we get a lot of brassicas, um, and some of those you can use, uh, and you know, in quiches and things like that. So. Uh, this is uh, rainbow chard 
and this is Cavallo Nero, both will grow through the winter as well. So you don't need to just have um, things that uh, are ready in the summer. We are growing year round. Again, things like kale and sprouts are similar. This year we've had a lot of uh, broad beans and radishes as we have in previous years. Um, broad beans will freeze quite well. Uh, radishes tend to need to be eaten as they are, but again, the um, chutneys and things like that is a nice line in, in radish chutney um, or pickled radish is quite nice as well. Uh, fruit, in addition to the gooseberries I've mentioned, we're getting a lot of Logan berries this year and black currants um, as well, just coming along and red currants with them. Um, it's one of those things that uh, we get uh, different um, different fruit each year, it seems. Um, but the last few years, it does seem to have been the gooseberries and the Logan berries that have, have been uh, kind of it at, the, at the front of the queue in terms of, of volume and quantity. I mentioned uh, courgettes and, you know, they are a pretty versatile veg. They don't freeze all that well. And this is kind of the point where you need to think about if you can't freeze them as a veg, can you convert them into something else and freeze that? So these courgette and red Leicester cheese muffins freeze really well um, and are really tasty. And if you don't tell anybody they've got a courgette in, they won't know, I guarantee it. Um, and they are quite, you know, obviously savoury muffin rather than a fruity uh, sweet muffin. But as I say, it's thinking a little bit um, outside of the of the box and, and you know, where some of those uh, different opportunities come in terms of uh, flans and quiches and pies and things like that um, always worth exploring a lot of um, our history is around a plot to plate and um, around certain times of the year and you'll be familiar with things like harvest festival probably um, but there are um, what are known as four quarter days in a year. There's Lady Day, which is in March, Midsummer, uh, which is in June, Christmas, which is obviously in December, and then Michaelmas, which you may not have heard of, um, which is uh, in September, and normally around the 29th of September. Uh, it's close to that autumnal equinox as possible and the saying goes if you eat a goose on Michaelmas day you want not for money all the year so it's also known as goose day um, or the feast of michael and all angels and uh, it's one of those uh, dates a bit like um, harvest festival when it's when things like if you go back to uh, the Middle Ages and and around those times when servants were hired, rents were due or leases were begun. Um, and, you know, said that obviously harvests were completed by Michaelmas and it was the marking the end of the productive season and the beginning of a new uh, cycle of, of, of the farm year. And, you know, I think there's still to this day some elements where um, we celebrate uh, these festivals maybe because we're not quite aware of why we do so you have goose fairs for example uh, there's a very famous one in Nottingham which is normally in the beginning of October um, and you know it's one of those times of year when you know food becomes very much a part of um, why we're growing um, various different things or we're producing various different things. Um, another one connected with apples is um, wassailing. So wassailing is a 
traditionally a celebration of of apple trees and cider making um it's normally occurs on around uh january but sort of christmas new year time and often um there'll be a, a procession to the local orchard where thanks is paid to the to the largest or the most prolific apple tree in in the orchard um and cider is poured on the roots um, and pieces of soaked toast or cook or cake are put in the branches of the tree for robins which is the guardian spirit of the trees uh, songs are sung uh, poems are, are told um, and the community comes together to celebrate the orchard and the coming growing season um, apples are also celebrated in a in another way um, across the production of, of apple cakes and it seems that different regions have different types of, of, of apple cake so you'll find there's a, a, a Hampshire apple cake a Cornish apple cake a Somerset apple cake a Dorset apple cake a Devon apple cake um, all different recipes uh, so a Devon apple cake for example is is an apple puree with cinnamon and raisins and a Cornish one is more like a tart tatin um, and some will have currants and different spices and, and things like that in um, apple and walnut muffins I seem to have a thing about muffins but if you're growing if you're um, making courgette and red Leicester muffins also have a go at uh, apple and walnut muffins they're fantastic as well um, I come back once again just to close about you know plot to plate is not about uh, just growing stuff it is about grow what you love to eat um, and you know if you it, why grow stuff that you're not going to eat it doesn't just doesn't make sense so think when you're uh, making your plans for the for the growing season what is it that you love to eat the most and grow that Thanks very much for listening to my talk. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer them. Obviously, I can't do that in person because this is a, a virtual talk, but um, I am on social media, both on Twitter and Instagram as Tonto Williams. So if you've got any questions, do reach out to me there. Uh, as I say, thank you very much for listening to my show, to my talk. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. and. Uh, have a great day. Thanks for listening. Bye.